the reason that we are making a distinction between pro-life and abolition or abolitionist and pro-lifer isn't tribal. It isn't, it isn't this sort of thing like we wanted, we looked at the scene and said, man, we could make like a club like within the scene and like have our thing and have our word. Sometimes whenever a paradigm of thought is reigning supreme and has been reigning for 40 or so years for whatever reasons, it seems to always be in 40 years increments. It's, it's about the length of biological activity for like adults, you know, like adult males, like I got 40 years of fight in them. And so sometimes it seems like for paradigms that last about 40 years, there is a problem and there's an answer that's offered for that problem. And if in about 40 years, the paradigm that is offered as an answer to the problem fails to answer the questions, it sends society or culture or science or theology or whatever it is into sort of a crisis state. And whenever it enters into a crisis state, what generally occurs is sort of young people who are not a part of the establishment or a part of the previous paradigm come along and see the world differently and say, I think things need to shift. And so... I think a lot of us that are, you know, didn't become abolitionists overnight, but some of us did because we grew up and we saw all the pro-life movement's answers, and we knew from our parents that they'd been offering those answers for 40 years, and there were still children dying. And so, you know, speaking on behalf of some of these early innovators, the early kind of abolitionist folks, the reason we drew such a stark line between pro-life and abolition wasn't so we had something to brag about or something to be arrogant about, something to say, we're right, you're wrong. It had a very distinct um, ideological, legal, cultural, um, rhetorical, strategic um, meaning. And so that's what this talk is about. Pro-life or abolition, demarcating the differences. And demarcating is just drawing a line. What is the line of difference between pro-life and abolition? And specifically, like, we could do this lecture in five major ways. Like, what do the pro-life movement, how do they talk about theology, you know? Generally kind of leave that stuff out, try to save the babies, don't bring up the gospel. Like, that's, some other, that's a different thing. Abolitionists are kind of like lead with the gospel, lead with theology. So there's like, there are big differences between pro-lifers and abolitionists on, on other things besides this where it comes into play legislatively, but this is specifically, what is the difference between a pro-life and abolition bill? So now we begin to move very quickly. We're gonna look at an abolition bill first, right? I think these are the new kids on the block. We've had, you know, you know six or seven, there's seven of them filed this year, and um, that's awesome, but it's the new kid on the block and one you are becoming familiar with, but these are the common distinctions of an abolition bill. The focus, the thing that the abolition bill is aiming for, it's seeking the total and immediate abolition of abortion as murder. Important sentence, we'll break it down, total and immediate. So what do we mean by total and immediate? Total, no exceptions. An abolition bill is total abolition, no exceptions. Immediate means not incrementally, okay? We're just defining these bills, but not incrementally. We're talking about total, no exceptions, and not incrementally. The way that we've been talking about this for some time in the culture that many of you are familiar with, but some of you might be new to, a pro-life bill and abolition bill, if you want to look at abortion as the problem, you want to look at abortion and you want to think of it as a tree, you've got in our culture, you've got all sorts of ways of killing children. You've got chemical abortions. You've got surgical abortions. They're both abortions. Among the chemical abortions, there's various ways of killing children chemically up through during the first trimester. There's abortifacients that you can get over the counter. There's abortifacients that you have to go to a clinic for, and there's abortifacients you can order in the mail. But, you know, you have your RU486s, you have your Plan Bs, you have various abortifacients. But those are chemical abortions. And then there's surgical abortions. And among surgical abortions, they're all dismemberment abortions, okay? So you've got curatage dismemberment abortions, you've got suction abortions, you've got abortions that are carried out by forceps, and these are different tools used to dismember a child. And of course you have dismemberment abortions that are late term, sometimes partially 
um, birthing the child, killing the child with a chemical and, you know, removing them very late in the process. But the abolitionists, when they look at this tree, they don't go for an incremental or a piecemeal part of the tree. They say the whole tree is murder. It doesn't matter if you're killing a child chemically or surgically. It doesn't matter what kind of instrument you're using, whether it's forceps or it's a high dose of some kind of drug that makes the pregnancy you know, slip out of the womb. It doesn't matter. You're murdering an image bearer. So the abolitionist looks at the whole tree. The pro-lifer tends to come to the tree with shears and look for a branch to remove instead of chopping down the whole tree like an abolitionist. So that's what the abolitionist means. Very simple. The abolition bill doesn't mess around with the branches, goes for the root. All right, so that's total. That's immediate. No increments, no exceptions. Abolition is a specific, very strong word, and it is talking about the formal act of putting an end to something, annulling it. Now, you can use end as a synonym. You can use things like we're here to destroy abortion, here to stop abortion, we're here to end abortion, so on and so forth. But when you read a book and you get to the end of the book, you're not abolishing the book. When you watch a movie and the movie comes to an end, you have not come to the abolition of the movie. Abolition is this strong word in Western culture. It's a formal act of putting an end to something. So abolition is actually not just saying that it came to an end. Theoretically, abortion could come to an end without a formal act of putting something against it. But an abolition bill actively and specifically seeks to prohibit abortion, abolishing it. And prohibition is explicit. All right, we're not talking about doing something else that then leads to abolition. We're talking about explicit bans on abortion in and of itself. And that requires, in our culture, in accordance with our laws, criminalization. There has to be something that says, you cannot do this. An abolition bill says, you, person out in culture, cannot do this. It's a criminal act. We have a law against it. Of course, people can still break that law, but it's a criminal act that they're doing, and they know that, and the law's a tutor. So abolition bills criminalize abortion. Now they do this because they treat abortion as murder. And if the laws against murder are going to be equally applied to all humans, it's going to be following that we criminalize abortion and that protection requires the prohibition and prohibition requires justice. There's got to be punishment. An abolition bill does not shy away from the idea of justice. It's like the word of God over and over again, the prophets say, I want you to establish justice for the fatherless, not just encourage people to make a better choice. The abolition bill says we need justice, and justice requires criminalization. So we're seeking, in the, in the end, equal justice under a law. So that's like the, that's the focus of an abolition bill. Now, as I was talking to some folks today, media folks, they're, kind of, they're always saying, well, yeah, but you can't do that. You know, you can't do that. Abolition bills are folly. But criminalization is actually, and the important thing here is that when an abolition bill is written, it's not written in such a way as you don't look at, you don't look at Roe v. Wade and say, what are we allowed to do in regard to abortion? You look at the central holding in Roe v. Wade, and the central holding in Roe v. Wade is that apparently, constitutionally, Mothers have the right to terminate their pregnancies, that is, murder their children in the womb, as a constitutional right. An abolitionist bill doesn't sort of skirt around that. It says, that's wrong. It challenges it essentially outright. So it challenges the essential holding in Roe v. Wade and says that the Supreme Court was actually wrong. Okay, it just literally, it just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work within the Supreme Court, it challenges the Supreme Court. Mothers do not have the right to murder their children. Roe is unjust and Roe is unconstitutional. First, I would say this, and I love that uh, Julia Bender has a video on our webpage about this. Some say, well, the reason that abortion is, is wrong is because it's unconstitutional. Now, thankfully, we try to abolish abortion it is unconstitutional, but let's say the Constitution of the United States really did say in the 14th Amendment somewhere, mothers have the right to murder their babies. What would we do then? Say, well, it's constitutional. No, we would say the Constitution is wrong, right? Yes. 
we would say the Constitution needs to be amended. This is one of the differences between abolitionists today and abolitionists of slavery. They had to amend the Constitution because the Constitution allowed slaveholding whenever they built the country. So they had to amend it. But luckily, we do not have to write a new Constitution. We do not have to defy the Constitution, but we would. It is not our authority. The Word of God is our authority, and the reality of His world is our authority. So an abolition bill would, but we don't have to, because abortion is not constitutional. Secondly, what is con unconstitutional is Roe. Roe is unconstitutional. An abolition bill assumes this and is written with this in mind. The right to murder preborn human beings is nowhere to be found in the Constitution, period. So an abolition bill challenges that essential holding without any sort of um, subservience or obsequious sort of like, what about the Supreme Court? Abolitionists say the Supreme Court can pound sand. So the abolition bill is generally written in such a way that it's taking as a given that murdering children was, was not in the minds of Thomas Jefferson or, or you know, it just the founding fathers weren't like, people won't be free unless they can practice child sacrifice with advanced medical technologies. That's not in the Constitution. Roe is wrong. And so what do you do with an unjust ruling like Roe? You ignore it because you have states that make laws. Courts do not make laws. They issue opinions. And when those opinions are wrong, you do not have to uphold them. The good thing is, is that there is nothing in our system of government that says you have to uphold court rulings. But all the folks that we vote for, the sheriffs, the legislators, the governors, they have all taken an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, not uphold and defend any ruling of the Supreme Court. If that was true, the Supreme Court never overturned Dred Scott, right? If you found someone who had a slave, according to the Supreme Court, you can't help that slave. The Supreme Court ruled against that, right? So we don't uphold and defend unjust, wicked Supreme Court rulings. And there are more than abortion. An abolition bill will often be called justly. Sometimes they'll use this word to try to scare us. A nullification bill. An abolition bill is not trying. It would be great if the abolition bill did something and um, ended up overturning Roe for the rest of the union. But let's say the rest, say Senate Bill 13 passes and we say we're going to nullify these unjust federal decrees and in the state of Oklahoma, we're going to protect preborn human beings with the same laws against murder. Here in Oklahoma, we're nullifying your unjust rule and say no other state followed. Say it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says you're not allowed to do that, Oklahoma. Oklahoma would have to say, well, I guess the Supreme Court, you better send your army. They don't have one. So, so an abolition bill is a nullification bill that assumes state sovereignty. Now, the beautiful thing about an abolition bill, and it's funny because people don't understand that, but all this stuff, this no compromise, this justice delayed is denied, all of it really is, in fact, constitutional. It upholds and defends the Constitution. Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. That's laws against abortion. Murder laws in your state do not belong to the federal government. They belong to the states, and that is in the federal constitution. So as Thomas Jefferson said, every state has a natural right to nullify. Now, why did Jefferson at the beginning of this great experiment say these things? He said these in multiple places. Every state has a natural right to nullify. And one of the things that they were fearful of, and I'm going to read this full quote, because it's so important, is this idea of exactly what we're facing, a federal judiciary that acts tyrannical. Writing to a, uh, to a fellow statesman, he says, you seem to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions, a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. Our judges are as honest as other men, and not more so. Have you ever wondered why it is that nine unelected appointed lawyers get to decide like the morality of 63 million lives? Just like nine appointed old white dudes in black dresses back in 1972 got to decide this? 
The judges are as honest as other men and not more so. They have with others the same passions for party, for power, and the pri privilege of their courts. Their power is the more dangerous as they are in office for life. So he's writing about the, the, the situation where these were appointed for life and not responsible as the other functionaries are to elective control. Like the judges are put in place and they start acting like tyrants and there's no way to vote them out. The Constitution has erected no such single tribunal, knowing that to whatever hands confided with the corruptions of time and party, its members would become despots. He's exactly talking about it. He's talking about exactly what we face today. A Constitution um, that never sanctioned it. It has more wisely made all the departments co-equal and co-sovereign with themselves. So from the founding of the nation, the union, this great experiment of America, it was never intended that all the states would simply sit there and let unjust, wicked decrees be made law in their lands, that they would have recourse to nullification. In fact, the country was founded upon a document which I think is far superior to the Constitution myself, and I love this document, you should love it too, because it's an abolitionist document, we'll get to it. But one of my favorite things about it, because I design propaganda, is the way it says, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, you know? We're talking about this is a state sovereignty. These were states, and what were they doing? They were coming together to stand against a tyrant, a tyrant that they believe had violated natural, unalienable rights, which were endowed to them by their creator. These weren't rights that came from a constitution or from any men. These were, these were rights that came from a creator among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. When any government becomes the enemy of the unalienable right to life, it is the right of the people in order to secure their rights that they abolish it. What we are doing from our bills to our movement through and through is exactly what founded this nation, all right? And it's something that's been lost. So an abolitionist bill, all that stuff that I've said before is just simply the good and true thing that everybody else says. One of the, one of the great abolitionists from history, um, Garrison, who a lot of us talk about, he basically just, he said, you know what, this whole time, you know, the, this whole time we've been trying to abolish human chattel slavery. All it is, our fanaticism from the beginning to this hour has consisted in nothing but meaning what we say of the Declaration of Independence. We believe in the inalienable rights of man. Our crime has been that we have refused to compromise these rights to accommodate any party or sect or to sustain any law, constitution, or compact. We'll surely be vindicated in the court of conscience and the tribunal of God. Right? So we're talking about from the founding through the early abolition movement, we are not doing anything strange or weird or unconstitutional. Our culture is strange, weird, unconstitutional, and run by tyrants. An abolition bill defies tyrants. Yeah, you clap for that because it's cool. So an abolition bill is going to include all of these elements, but it's going to lead to interposition. It would be great if we just said we're going to abolish some evil, we're going to defy tyrants, and the tyrants are like, cool. Which in a certain way right now with the current president we have, I don't know, maybe he would be like, cool, like, if Oklahoma wants to do that, but I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell which day you're on Twitter. So it may require interposition. It may require us to stand up to the federal government who says, hey, listen, if you're going to abolish abortion there and disregard the Supreme Court, we're not going to send you federal aid or something. And so it could cost something. It could cost us, say, Governor Stitt signed Senate Bill 13, and they say, well, we're going to come remove you from office. That might mean the rest of us are sleeping out in front of his house and barricades or something really cool like Les Mis and we can have a cool song and Josh can write it. But it may cost us something and I think it would be fun to get there, but I don't know if it will. So 
interposition. So you've got this bill to establish justice, equal protection, and all of that is an abolition bill, and that is what an abolition bill is. Pro-life bills, the pro-life bill is a little bit more convoluted. So let's look at it. Pro-life bill seeks to save babies and women from abortion and reduce abortion numbers. Now, I am actually trying very hard, and it's harder for me than for you, to be very kind here and be accurate and not misrepresent them. I think that a pro-lifer, when they write the bill, is in a place in their heart where they're saying, I want to save babies, I want to help women, and I want to save them from abortion, both babies and women, and I want to reduce the number of abortions that occur in culture. And that's what a pro-life bill is written. So it's distinct from an abolition bill, but it doesn't sound that bad. We're going to save babies and women from abortion, and we're going to reduce the numbers. A pro-life bill is talking about two victims here. And in the process of saving babies, unlike the abolition bill that denied increments, the pro-life bill will literally seek increments, okay? An abolition bill, no increments. Pro-life bill seeks increments and will, for the sake of reducing abortion numbers, allow exceptions. So if we want to go back over to our tree, we, get, we go to the pro-lifer. We'll look at a pro-life bill, one that's been successful, one that sort of is the flagship, something that's been passed here in Oklahoma, the dismemberment abortion ban, celebrated House Resolution 3515, upheld by a judge. Oklahoma judge upholds a state law banning abortion. Now, you look at the law. The law literally says that you cannot use grasping forceps, tongs, scissors, or similar instruments through the convergence of two rigid livers, levers to slice, crush, or grasp a portion of the unborn child. So the pro-life law that we're talking about here literally looks at the abortion tree all those different ways and says this specific way of aborting babies will be prohibited by law. Now you keep on reading right there. That's A in the law. Here's B. Now this does not include an abortion which uses suction to dismember the body of the unborn child by sucking fetal parts into a collection container unless the actions described in subparagraph A are used to cause the death of an unborn child, but suction is subsequently used to extract fetal parts after the death of the unborn child. So you cannot dismember a child with forceps, but you can dismember a child with a high-powered vacuum. It's called a dismemberment ban, and it literally says, you can dismember, uh, dismember a baby with a suction device. It's literally in the law. It's written by pro-lifers. It's celebrated, and people pray and thank God that it was passed. You can suck fetal parts into a container, right? These things are celebrated as pro-life victories. Curatage and suction abortions far outnumber forcep abortions, and of course, this is why these things get upheld. And the truth of the matter is, and I didn't draw this tree to scale because it would be awful as a piece of art. The tree would look awful. And it would just kind of go and go and go. Chemical abortions outnumber surgical abortions vastly. So if we really wanted to get some numbers on it without a drawing, 88 to 92 percent of all abortions happen in the first trimester, six to eight weeks. That is not requiring forceps to be used. And 7% in second trimester, 14 to 20 weeks, those babies can be killed by suction. And if they need to be killed by forceps, there are other ways around that. And generally, that same law says you can kill a baby by forceps if the baby was maybe, you know, severely disabled or trouble for the mother or conceived in rape or something like that. So we are talking about a law that removes a branch of the tree that the pro-lifer can then pick up Say, look what I've done, get roses, be celebrated, but the tree remains, right? But the idea was to save babies and women from abortion and reduce abortion numbers. So a pro-life law, you have to understand specifically from that law, allows some babies to be aborted if it saves other babies. A, save these babies from forceps, but B, allow them to be killed by suction devices because the idea is that that'll allow some babies to be saved and that compromise here is key, right? So a pro-life bill allows some compromise because it's trying to get the best that we can get and do the most good. Pro-life apologists will argue that our bills are bad because we're not trying to get the best that we can get and do the most good. We should compromise. That's the key. Save as many lives as possible. You can't fight child sacrifice 
without practicing it is essentially what the pro-life are saying there. He would never say it that way, but we have to sacrifice some children to save other children. If you've ever gone out to an abortion clinic and you've talked to someone as they're going in, excuse me, mill, child sacrifice center, you talk to someone that's going in and you say, why are you aborting this child? Sometimes they'll say, because I can barely afford to feed my four other children, right? So they're allowing this child to die to help these children, right? So the people who are practicing abortion are doing it on the same logic as the people who are writing bills to fight abortion, fighting child sacrifice with child sacrifice. Compromise is key because we're trying to reduce abortion numbers. Now a pro-life bill is also written to protect women from abortion, women from abortion, to save women from abortion, in fact, is the, the rhetoric sometimes employed. So they have, generally speaking, and if you've seen babies are still murdered here, or if you've been paying attention to um, lots of the debate online and so on and so forth, the pro-life movement leaders, the establishment leaders, will go on record and say no pro-life leader is actually for criminalizing the mother. That's what they'll say. When Donald Trump was asked during his um, campaign by Chris Matthews of Hardball said, well, you know, if we sanctioned abortion, would there have to be a punishment for it? He's like, yeah, because I mean, Donald Trump's kind of like thinking logically when the question's asked and he hasn't yet consulted with like students for life or priests for life or Abby Johnson or something. He's like, yeah, I mean, if we're gonna prohibit it, there's got to be some kind of punishment, right? Makes sense. You can't say, like, you're not allowed to do that, but if you do it, nothing's going to happen. It doesn't make any sense. Donald Trump, against some things that he does, is not an idiot. Kind of smart, right? Logical thought, yes. Now, within, like, a day, Donald Trump took it back. And he was like, oh, my bad. No, there would be no punishment. Like, that guy never takes anything back, but he took that back. Why did he take it back? because the pro-life movement establishment leaders got to him and said, no, 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 Donald, that's not how we talk. We never criminalize the woman. So when they say the woman, they don't say the mother. It's a problem, but it's a different lecture. So the, the, the women in our culture are, are being sort of victimized by abortion. And so pro-life laws sometimes, or most of the time, are written to help the woman make a better choice or to try to save babies by doing things like parental consent, waiting period laws, ultrasound laws, the idea if, a, if you put an ultrasound law into play, they'll look at an ultrasound, they won't have an abortion, educational laws, informed reversal pill laws, all laws designed to try to get women to make a better choice. Right now, before the legislature, you have HB 2592, which is grants for choosing childbirth act. So this is a bill put forward by the pro-life champion hero, Senator Greg Treat, who, along with John Eccles in the House, wants to establish a grant and give $2 million to Choosing Childbirth Act grants. Now, this is something in the state of Oklahoma that they do from time to time. And then whenever the budget comes around, they're like, oh, we don't have it. And so they cut it. But what this allows the pro-lifer to do is say, we're going to pass a bill giving more money to build more websites, to put signs in bathrooms, or whatever we can do to help women make a better choice. So these are pro-life laws that are designed to reduce abortion numbers until Roe is overturned. Everyone following me on this? Is, this? is this easy? Is everyone like, I've heard this. So reducing abortion numbers instead of abolishing abortion as murder. So it means regulate abortion or regulate the abortion industry. So pro-life laws usually talk about ages, stages, methods of abortion, reasons given for abortion. On regulating the abortion industry, it's who can perform abortions, when abortions must be performed, how abortions are performed, what must be done before an abortion is performed, on and on, where abortions may be performed. Like if you're going to murder a baby, you've got to do it within a mile of a hospital. You've got to have hospital visiting privileges. You've got to use this kind of pipe in your abortion mill. Literally, it's a pro-life law. You have to, because the idea was they looked at the, the abortion clinics and they said, these all have copper pipes. Let's pass a law saying if you're going to murder babies, you got to use. So what did they do? Well, they just tore down that clinic. The pro-lifers had a party. They ran a fundraiser. They built a bigger clinic, and they said, hmm. And now all the babies are being murdered with the, with the right kind of pipes in the walls. But they regulate the abortion industry, making the abortion industry stronger. For those of you who have been in this battle a long time, you've noticed that the uh, abortion clinics have become fortresses. 
as a result of these things. Now, one that we are all studying right now is who can perform abortion. So if we go back to the tree, there is a bill, HB 1182, revoking the medical licenses to do abortions. This isn't even on the tree. You've got to understand. I was thinking, how am I going to use the tree analogy to explain what HB 1182 is? Well, HB 1182 isn't saying that abortions murder and you can't abort your babies. It just says if you're a doctor, you're not allowed to have a license to do it. So I put a heartbreaking picture up on, on Facebook of a baby in the bottom of a toilet, and I say HB 1182 does not criminalize this because a mother has a constitutional right to terminate her child, Supreme Court said. And I had to do it this way because there were no doctors with licenses. But she wouldn't get in trouble, and that would be the way abortions happen. Do-it-yourself abortions, completely protected by law. So it's not even dealing with the tree. So they do all these weird things to regulate the abortion industry. There's a bunch of them. We could go through them, you know, like defunding things and stuff like that. But in the end, if we want to look at them charitably, um, they say, well, in the instance of HB 1182, we can't abolish abortion as murder, so since we can't do that, let's try to reduce it, get the best that we can. Now, that would make sense in some states, states possibly. But if you look at the state of Oklahoma, HB 1182 versus Senate Bill 13, here we have Joseph Silk with an ax and a full head of hair, and you've got HB 1182, and you say, okay, so we want to get the best that we can get. As Blake Gideon said in the press release for HB 1182, this is the, we want to do the strongest thing we can do. Okay, HB 1182 revoked the medical licenses. How did that go? Votes for and against. Voting for it, 71. Voting against it, 21. Right? Let's get the best that we can get. We've got 71 votes for this. You go down the line and you ask each of those people who voted for HB 1182, why did you vote for this? They will tell you something like, because I love babies, I believe that abortion's brutal and heinous, and it needs to be ended, and I just wanted, I wanted, to, I wanted to do this because I, I love God or I love children or whatever it is. That's why I voted for it. The problem is all those quotes that they're saying are not about HB 1182. It isn't, I love the Hippocratic Oath, and I really want to make sure that doctors aren't doing no harm. Is what, that's, not how they're say, that's not how they're saying this bill is the reason that they woke up and did this. They're saying because they want to do the best that they can get. Well, the fact of the matter is, is the best was Senate Bill 13. And if you want to know how the vote would have shook out, it would have been like this. 71 votes for Senate Bill 13, 21 against. Because everyone who voted for HB 1182 says that they voted for it because they think it's better than Senate Bill 13. And that is a lie because pro-life bills do not seek to abolish abortion as murder. I think you get the drift. Now, there are crazy things that pro-lifers do that I'd love to talk about, but they're not even on the Hill. So we'll just move back to it. Defunding abortion, that sort of thing. Okay, so this is a pro-life bill, right? A little bit more convoluted, a little more specific, but pro-life bill, never criminalize the woman. The implications are we might be able to punish the abortionist who violate regulations. Not abortionists, mind you, that murder children. You can't punish an abortionist because they murder children. You can punish an abortionist for violating regulations. Does anyone know who Kermit Gosnell is? Does anyone know how his court went down? Did any of you know that it was a complete pro-abortion, pro-choice abortion ruling? That is not how the pro-life movement sold it to you. But Kermit Gosnell was not held responsible for any murder of any preborn child. He was only in trouble for violating regulations, various drugs that he gave to people, various things that he did that were not abortions. They found him innocent of the hundreds of thousands of babies that he murdered because those were legal, but it's celebrated. And then they try to shut down abortion clinics who violate regulations. You see this from time to time on Facebook. Yay, they shut down the clinic before it reopened, so on and so forth. Now, the whole time all this pro-life stuff is going on, and they're making all these laws about waiting 72 hours, you got to get your parents' permission, you've got to do it at this place with this kind of guy, with this kind of license, all this kind of stuff. The problem is, is they're living in the age of the Internet, and guess what these women are thinking today? Perhaps I can just order one of those online 
right? Now, the problem is, is the pro-lifers are out there trying to combat abolition bills, and they're including in their legislation, never criminalize the woman, right? Because they're trying to make themselves superior and more compassionate than us. So they include never criminalize the woman, thereby legalizing and protecting by law do-it-yourself chemical abortions, which are on the rise and making up more of the abortions now than any of us know. So that's a pro-life. How do they, how do they get so weird? How does it get so messed up and unjust and iniquitous? How does it do that? Well, it's because they're trying to work within the parameters of Roe v. Wade, KCV Planned Parenthood, and the 37 other Supreme Court cases that follow Roe v. Wade. Because unlike the abolition bill, all this sort of messing around with branches and bushes and all that kind of stuff, which may or may not save children, it's really hard to tell. As Brother Bill pointed out, abortion numbers are going up in Oklahoma. They literally go up after the dismemberment abortion ban goes into effect. So we passed this to save lives and the number went up. Why? What's, what's, what, what, what is all this insanity coming from? Well, it's because they're working within the parameters of Roe. They are accepting that the right to abortion is, unfortunately, a constitutional right. They look at the Supreme Court. They say the Supreme Court has ruled from on high abortion is a constitutional right, and pro-lifers argue that abolition is unconstitutional and abortion is constitutional. And you're like, no, you're, now you're lying about them. I am not lying about them. Roe is unjust, but the courts have ruled is the mantra of the pro-lifers who are opposing the abolitionist movement day in and day out in our country. So this is Scott Klusendorf. He is probably the most esteemed, um, influential pro-life apologist. When he began to interact with abolitionists, he did not humbly say, wow, you know what, we should just challenge the court and abolish abortion as murder because I'm a Christian and that makes a lot of sense. For whatever reason, don't know his heart, don't know his motives, he said, we can't abolish abortion. We can't just end all abortions. We can't do that because the federal courts have already decided in Roe v. Wade, in the Casey decision and others, that no unborn children have the right to life. They've already dictated that from on high. But you know what's sick about this? He says this on a stage with like leading theologians and pastors gathered together. We're talking about like Todd Friel's the host and Bodie Bauckham's on the stage and and, and other luminaries, and he is saying incrementalism is not unbiblical because the courts have ruled. So the pro-lifer who compromises and practices child sacrifice and the fight against child sacrifice is biblical because the courts have already ruled. Recently, in a, on a Desiring God uh, article that he wrote, he, he reiterated it. He doesn't like the fact that we call them regulationists who decide which babies live and which die. Literally, that bill, the dismemberment bill, these babies live, these babies don't. We're not the ones doing that. We don't have the power. That belongs to the Supreme Court. And writing for Desiring God, again, Scott Klusendorf says, Christians are supposed to limit the evil insofar as possible given current legal realities. With all... With God, all things are possible, Scott. Anyway, I don't put that up there to argue with Scott. I just say that that's what pro-lifers say. say. Now, Abby Johnson, maybe you're like, oh, that's an apologist. He's an evidentialist, so his mind doesn't work anyway. Like, he, you know, let's just, you know, that's Scott, right? Well, Abby Johnson, she's the most famous, and we're talking about a pro-lifer that's worth $108 million, the most sought-after pro-lifer, living in Texas, when a bill of abolition was put forward, everyone said, Abby, Abby, what do you think about the bill of total and immediate abolition? What do you think about this thing? And she said quite boldly, I do not support this bill because it is unconstitutional. Okay? The bill to abolish abortion as murder is unconstitutional. Abolition is unconstitutional. I am not lying about these people. We've made great strides in Texas, Texas by passing constitutional legislation that works. And then, as I said, I also do not support any legislation that punishes women. So again, working within the parameters of Roe v. Wade, right? Abolition is unconstitutional. Abortion is constitutional. Nullification? No. A pro-life bill does not nullify unjust, unconstitutional laws or decrees. They will not stand up against the court to save babies. State sovereignty? 
No. They do not look to a state to assert their sovereignty to abolish abortion. They don't buy the founding fathers' view. They bow down to the very thing that Thomas Jefferson was warning about, to the very thing that we should not have done. So nullification, no. State sovereignty, no. So with the Supreme Court, pro-lifers like pro-choicers are looking to a court of unelected men and women now and complying with them and bowing down to them, saying we cannot protect babies in our states until you say we can. That is the foundational working within the parameters of uh, the Supreme Court's ruling in Roe v. Wade, bowing down and hoping for a new pro-life president to elect more pro-life judges who then maybe will abolish abortion. Give to pro-life organizations. All of these pro-life bills and everything involved in this are, is not to uh, establish justice, but to delay it. The point of a pro-life bill in your state, and this is kind of like, it ought to hit you hard, but maybe you're used to it, is to delay abolition. That's what they're writing them for. And you say, now you've got your tin foil hat on, right? The pro-lifer is writing a law and trying to pass it so that they don't have to pass Senate Bill 13. Okay, so yesterday in the state of Oklahoma, didn't have time to put it in the slides, HB 1182 was literally the bill that none of us wanted, that none of us are calling for, that the Baptist convention was not meaning in their resolution, that the free will Baptists was, were not meaning, that the Republican Party was, were not wanting. HB 1182 was not those things. But what did the pro-life establishment and their leaders, religious authorities, do? They wrote a different bill, and they passed it so that they wouldn't have to pass Senate Bill 13, but they could say that they were doing something, delaying abolition. That's their function. That is th what they've been doing for 45 years. And the moment that we stop playing around with these things and complying with the courts and start passing abolition bills, we will see an end to this great evil. So that's a pro-life bill. This is an abolition bill. Senate Bill 13 is one of these, and it's not alone. When I made this slide, there were six bills. And when I was in the drive through at Chick-fil-A, I made this one for the bill that was just filed. So, which is great. Mike Moon. So the beautiful thing, and you've set through this sort of uh, belabored exercise, and you say, well, but what, is it going to work? It'll work. It'll work. As soon as we draw this line, and explain no more of this, more of this, or actually no more of this, only this. And that's what we're doing here with uh, Free the States and the Ecclesia and the organizations here in Oklahoma with Operation Save America, End Abortion Now, Missionaries to Preborn, the various abolitionist organizations in the union. We're saying no more of this pro-life nonsense. We want total, immediate abolition to the glory of God. Those are the differences.